Hello everyone, the instant camera guy here. 1,000 subscribers in about two months. Well, I would be lying if I didn't say that was about 900 more than I ever thought to achieve <laughs> um, when I made this channel. And uh, basically to celebrate, what I wanted to do today was a little uh, AMA, Ask Me Anything. So last week I asked you guys to submit your questions. I got a whole bunch of them come through. And uh, what I'm going to do here, uh, I might take a few cuts uh, in order to do this, but I plan on answering them as best as I possibly can. Now before I launch into that, I wanted to say to anyone that's watching this, especially if you were one of those 1,000 subscribers, thank you so much. Um, it absolutely means the world to me to have your support. And I know it doesn't sound like you guys might be doing enough. I mean, you're literally just clicking a button on a screen. Um, but doing so, leaving a comment, having that interaction, what that does is help get my name out there, it helps share the knowledge, uh, share what it is that I do. Most importantly, gives me a job because, well, this is what I do as my career. I, I refurbish these things. Uh, and so I just wanted to say thank you so much to everyone that has sent in a donation or a camera to fix or left a comment or, or, or anything that sort of helped this instant community. Um, now, one of the first subjects that I wanted to talk about, because this, this got asked a lot, actually. This got asked uh, even before I said that I was doing an AMA, and that is the question of what do you personally use? Now, the truth is I've got a lot of cameras. I've been doing this a hell of a long time. 13 years, I think, as a registered business, but I've been into cameras for a lot longer. So I have, I used to have a massive collection. My collection has since, has since downsized quite a lot. I sold a lot of it off uh, as I sort of um, uh, realized that I was just doing sort of gear acquisition syndrome. But um, one of the things to realize is being in the industry of repair, I've picked up a lot of this stuff very cheap and refurbished it myself. So if you think like, wow, this guy must be loaded, look at what he's showing off. Um, no, that's not the case. I've paid basically nothing for these things. So <laughs> please bear that in mind. I'm not wealthy by any stretch of the means. Um, but in terms of SX-70s, because I think the content on this channel is, is rather SX-70 heavy, I'm gonna focus that question on what SX-70s do I own? Uh, and this actually feeds into one of the questions that I got as well, which is what do I think is the perfect combination of SX-70 parts? And well, I own three SX-70s. A lot of people expect that number to be higher, but I only own three. Um, you'll note that none of them have a built-in flash uh, because I, I personally don't see that as a, a very big advantage. I have a mint flash bar. This is the very, very first generation when they teamed up with Impossible Project. Um, I mean, I must have been one of the first people to buy one of these things. It has served me very well ever since I got it like a decade ago. Um, but I'll quickly walk you guys through each of the videos. I mean, I'm sure I could spend an entire video on each of these cameras separately. Um, but each of these SX-70s are very unique uh, and rather special. So I think starting from left, mm, middle to right, this is like my most recent one, second most recent, and this was like my first um, this one here is an SX-70R converted camera, so it's got the manual Bluetooth PCB. I made it for myself because I've, I wanted to see what all the fuss was about, and I'm very happy with how it performs. Um, there's a recurring theme to owning each of my cameras in that my favorite style of doing any kind of custom build is one where from, you know, a few feet away the camera looks stock. But when you start looking at it closely, you go, hang on, that's not supposed to be like that. And I think this camera is a very good example of that. Um, it is an original 1972 Fairchild camera. Um, I, I believe that's what the serial number was from. It could be 73. Um, but you notice that it's got a tripod socket. <laughs> and that's because the actual chassis of the camera is from an SX-70 Sonar, uh, but the mirror, the bellows, all the panels are from that original Model 1. 
and I've actually drilled a hole in the original body panel to mount the tripod socket through so, uh, because the tripod socket is built into the chassis of the camera. It's not something that you can add or subtract. You actually have to swap the, the entire guts. And so that's what I've done. Um, it has two holes drilled as well for external power supplies, such as the Reservoir battery adapter, which I'm using here. Um, even this Reservoir adapter is modified. I actually removed the internal lithium ion batteries uh, and circuitry from this, installed a switch, and I've just wired it up to take triple A's. It's got two very large smoothing capacitors so that I can use 1.5 volt rechargeable Kratax. Uh, lithium-ion batteries. Uh, this outputs a nice steady 6 volts and it works really really well. Um, as I said the camera has the custom PCB and all of the leather on it is original SX70 leather. So the door, the top viewfinder panels, all the top panels are completely stock and the bottom leather panel is off an SX70 Alpha. Uh, it's ever so slightly a different shade but that was actually pretty common on standard SX-70s anyway, especially the earlier ones, you'll often find some of the body panels are slightly different shades. Um, but yeah, this works really, really well. And my intent with this build was to build a camera which from the outside looks very, very bog standard. But when you start to look at it in a bit more detail, you go, hang on, what on earth is happening here? So that's my first SX-70. Um, the next one here, uh, I've shown off on my Instagram before. Uh, if you guys have seen my Facebook page where I did a lot of live streams, you would have seen this one. This is a complete Frankenstein. Um, it's basically as Frankenstein as you can possibly get. It has parts from like, I, I think literally like eight or nine different cameras that went into making this. And so not only would I like to talk about my own cameras here, I'm gonna talk about what I think the perfect combination of parts are to make an SX-70. Because if you watch my channel, um, one of the things that I go on, to, uh, go on about is that different eras of SX-70 have their own pros and cons. Like for example, the original Model 1, there was a few design flaws within it because of like unforeseen aspects of the design that was you know, kind of because it was a rush to the market. They fixed that in later revisions, but in later revisions, Polaroid started cost reducing a lot of parts. So by the time the Alpha and the Sonar came about, they were using things like rivets instead of screws. Some of the solder was poor quality. Like there was, there's trade-offs, right? So um, with this camera, I tried to use all of my favorite parts <laughs> that I possibly could. So um, for starters, the rear panel here is off an SX-70 Model 3. Uh, as is the door. Now the reason for that is just a personal joke. I thought it would be very funny if I put a sonar shutter but advertised that it was an SX-73 because the SX-73, uh, being that it's not an SLR, is one of the hardest cameras to focus, whereas the sonar is one of the easiest. So that's just like a really nerdy, <laughs> a nerdy little thing that I did just as a bit of a joke. Um, it has the bellows from an SX-70 Model 1 because using those bellows are the easiest to replace. Those bellows that are on an SX-70 Model 1 are all held in place with screws instead of rivets. So, you know, hypothetically, if I accidentally stab it and put a hole in the bellows, they'll be easy to swap. Uh, the viewfinder is off an SX-70 Model 2, I believe, although the little arm on the side is from a sonar so that I could keep the little prism that shines LED light. Uh, the body, uh, sorry, the shutter of the camera is obviously from an SX-70 sonar. Um, the rollers are from an SLR-680 uh, because the SLR-680 has metal rollers instead of the rubberized coating. It, it makes them a little more reliable at the cost of putting micro scratches in the film if you look very, very carefully under a loop. Um, again, I've cut holes in the leather to put external power supplies such as the Reservoir battery adapter, uh, which looks really, really good on the black body. Uh, I've also put holes for two screws, and I've used SX-70 Model 1 screws to mount this bottom panel. There's no screws in the rear, I've only attached it using the screws at the front, and again, that makes this camera easy to take apart should I ever need to repair it. I've also got a hole on the side for external adjustment of the solenoid. 
Um, and most importantly, you guys are probably wondering what that little bit on the PCB is. Uh, sorry, in, in the flash socket is, uh, this camera has an open SX70 PCB. So the open SX70 project existed before the SX70R was a thing and is the brainchild of a guy called Joaquin de Prada who decided to make an open source manual control PCB very similar to the Mint Time Machine uh, for SX70 cameras. And I'm fortunate enough to have been sent two prototypes by Joaquin for beta testing. Um, I still need to tweak these. I, now that I'm knowing what I know now about calibrating solenoids and shutters from the SX70R project, I will be able to set these up a lot better for the actual manual control side of things. But on automatic mode, these cameras both work flawlessly. Um, I was actually... Uh, I'm the one that came up with the particular values that are used in the codes for these two cameras. Um, and it was my contribution to the project uh, to come up with a way to add an infrared filter in front of the uh, modern electric eye that's used on these boards. Now, I get a lot of questions about the OpenSX70 project. At the moment, it's still in development hell. Um, Joaquin has a new set of PCBs and stuff that he wants to test. Um, these are strictly prototypes. They're not for sale. Um, you could only really get them if you were involved with the project in some way, shape, or form. Um, but on auto mode, at least, these things work amazingly. I honestly haven't tried either of these very much on manual mode, but now that I know uh, what the specific aperture shapes are supposed to look like at various different settings, I would be able to calibrate these a lot better, I think. So uh, it is on my to-do list to probably do a more in-depth video showing off the whole OpenSX70 project, but uh, yeah, the Sonar is probably my favorite of the two cameras. Uh, and lastly, we have the first SX70, uh, OpenSX70 camera that I made. Um, it uses a late generation uh, Model 2 shutter housing, uh, I think an alpha flash fire assembly. The entire body is from an SX70 sonar. The front door is from a late generation Model 1, which had the same matte finish as the SX70 sonars. And again, to be a little bit different, I've reskinned this one in wood grain. This is uh, a genuine cherry wood that I've um, coated in a boiled linseed oil. So it gives that kind of tan appearance. So from afar, it looks like a standard SX-70. When you get close, you go, hang on, what's happening here? Um, yeah, this thing is a real joy to use. I, I really, really like it. Um, it has the sonar viewfinder so that there is, there is no uh, split prism. And I've installed a rule of thirds grid on these two cameras. This one I left stock. Um, so yeah, those, these are my personal cameras. Um, I have no real favorite out of all of them. Um, I try and rotate them as much as I can, but uh, being that I've been so involved in the SX-70R project recently, this is the one I use the most. Uh, these two, I want to recalibrate, so that's going to be one of my projects when I get some spare time. Um, now, another question that I wanted to follow up, just briefly actually, this isn't so much of a, I guess, a question, but a few people have mentioned it or asked in one way, shape, or form. Um, some with a genuine question, some I, I believe were more in the form of snarky comments. Uh, and that was, when am I going to do more short form content? Because, <laughs> I mean, if you guys have been on my channel, you notice that the vast majority of my repair videos are at least 40 minutes long, some of them two hours in length. Um, and there's a really short answer for that, and that's that I'll make shorter videos when I can repair a camera in three minutes. <laughs> um, I think maybe people misunderstand the point of my channel. I do have some shorter videos that are only 10 or so minutes long on little tips and things like that. But the primary content that I want to produce is not stuff that you necessarily have to watch, but stuff that, you know, you may just want to put on the background, but stuff that if you do want to watch, you can get a lot from it. And the truth of the matter is that when it comes to particularly the repair side of these things or some of the videos where I'm discussing, uh, you know, 
possible design flaws and, and ways to rectify things, such as um, such as my uh, Polaroid one-step video. This is one I'm in the process of converting to a, to take a fisheye lens. It's got a retrograde engineer um, adapter on it. Um, this is one where, where I talked for 40 minutes about I-type batteries um, and how in the modern Polaroid cameras, they're sort of made to not be easily used or replaceable. Um, and I genuinely, like, there's a lot to talk about when it comes to those subjects. And I think that there's a lot to say. And if I'm going to be honest, I, I don't think they're the kind of things where you can really wrap it up neatly in a bow in a little three minute video um, for someone that doesn't have the attention span <laughs> to uh, to dive into the subject in, in more detail. It, d does that kind of make sense? Like, so... When it comes to the repair of these things, you'll find like a lot of pre-existing SX-70 content that out there is very much in the vein of like, the, what, what I call like the, the Mr. Beast or, or the TikTok style YouTube, which is like, it's all like, look at this one tip or trick or hack. And like, they might show you how to do something in a minute and 30 seconds, but there's no nuance. There's no explanation as to why it works or why you should or shouldn't do something. And a lot of it is also just kind of plain wrong as a result of that. Like there's, there's a lot of videos out there which are only kind of half true because they haven't really explained the nuance behind it. Like, you know, th there's a reason why, for example, in my SX-70R video, um, by the way, this camera is the one that I use in all of my introductions, in case you're wondering. That's how I did the automatic eject of the little instant camera guy photo. Um, I digress. There's a reason why in my SX-70R video, I digress and spend about five minutes talking about how the effective shutter design works on an SX-70, because Mint, who advertise a very similar product for their time machine cameras, uh, claim that you can do, well, not that they necessarily claim it, but they seem to allude that you can do one two thousandth of a second at f8, which just, that's not how the SX-70 shutter works. That's effectively how you would measure for that exposure. But in reality, it's more like, you know, one twenty one two fiftieth of a second at f32, because that's just how the shutter blades work. And so... You know, if I, if I describe the simple way of like, oh, well, here's how you meter for the scene, you don't gain the understanding of how the shutter actually works, and that means there's just going to be confusion later on. So I, I believe that it's quite important to get a lot of this knowledge out there, and there's just no way that I can do it in a way that's very, very short form. Um, I also just like to talk about this stuff, so... Um, and I enjoy watching content that is similar. Um, I love, for example, watching Adrian's Digital Basement, which is like, he. for those that don't know, he's a, an American guy who lives in Portland. Um, I highly recommend, if you're into tech, watch his channel, especially if you like old computers. And he will spend like an hour diving into fixing this, you know, old Commodore 64 or something like that. No script, total ad lib. You have no idea what on earth is going to happen. Um... No clue as to what's going on. Will he fix it? Will he not fix it? I really enjoy that kind of stuff because I get to see how another very clever individual's brain works. Um, I also like Adam Savage for that very reason. Um, you know, one of the former Mythbusters, he does another great channel called Tested. And some of the most enjoyable content on his channel is the Q&A section, like the, the question and answers, because it's just his pure, like unedited brain, right? Like, I, like I, I'm sure trying to condense that guy's information down must be so difficult for his editors. Um, but when I made this channel, I really wanted to be that kind of thing. I wanted the kind of channel where if you wanted to, you could sit down and watch and learn how to fix stuff. But if you just wanted something to listen to in the background and, and gain some little chunks of knowledge, you can do that too. So yeah, I don't really plan on making any very short content um, and the last reason, I, I just don't think it's good. Um, I think with this whole YouTube shorts and TikTok 
and Instagram reels where everything's very fast, very quickly edited, lots of information dump in a very short period of time. I just like I, as someone that's worked in healthcare for a long period of time, uh, in addition to working with uh, working with cameras, um, I've seen enough like patients of my own with various different uh, mental health issues. I, I, I just don't think it's healthy <laughs> for the brain to have such constant bombardment of short information. Um, I, I just don't think it's very good for us. I, and a lot of the information we just don't retain uh, as much as if we put a lot of concentration into something that's a little bit longer form. Um, one of my... Uh, one of my great coaches once told me, uh, you know, particularly when it comes to patient education, um, again, this goes back to my healthcare background, um, what you often want to do when you're educating someone is tell them what you're about to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. <laughs> and it's that constant repetition um, that I think really drives it home. And you guys, when you watch my videos, I'll probably make the same point like several times. And if I do that, it's not because I have Alzheimer's and, I, and I'm forgetting what I'm saying. It's because I, I want to drive that in. Um, and that's just how my brain works. Like repetition is key. Repetition is key and repetition is key. It really helps with learning. Um, but yeah, that's, that's sort of the, the two questions I wanted to answer. I'm going to pull out the rest of them because I got them saved on my phone. Um, and then we'll we'll talk through them. I'll try and put put some copies of them up up on the screen, as well. Um, but yeah, those those were things that came up in like various different comments even before I started um, asking you guys for questions. Um, so first question is uh, from Dennis from Chromatic Parts. He is another Polaroid refurbisher in the UK. Hi, Dennis. Um, he said, "What is my favorite part?" but my least favorite part about being a technician. So basically, what do I think is the best part about being a tech working on these cameras? And what is the worst part? Um, I think they are the same. <laughs> and that is like, like I know how the sausage is made, so to speak, <laughs> which is good and bad. Um, Part of being a technician and part of just me as a person, if you if you ever wanted to know anything about me as an individual, I love learning about design. Uh, I, I have an obsession with anything, um, anything in the realm of design. And like to the point where like once I, once I start to realize something about design, I mean like speaking of design, I'm just gonna, th thumb through this SX-70 repair book so you guys can appreciate how complicated the designs are of these things. I mean, like, it's ridiculous. So I'm just going to thumb through this while I, while I chat. Um, one of my favorite podcasts is 99% Invisible, which is a podcast hosted by Roman Mars. He talks a lot on uh, design, particularly the earlier episodes. And one of the take-home messages is that, like, everything you see in the built world has been designed right? Whether it's bad or good, someone made that, someone came up with the idea, and like a human did that. And I, I think that's really cool. But what studying design does is it starts to open your eyes to like bad design. It certainly opens your eyes to like good design, um, but it also opens your eyes to things where you go, why would anyone build something in such a way? Like, so one of the ways that it shapes me is obviously like a big advantage of being a technician. If my SX-70 ever breaks, I can fix it, right? This camera broke on me just the other day. It blew its reduction gear in the gear train. One hour later, it was back up and running with the leather glued on, right? Which I think is a, a really cool advantage. Just having handy, practical skills is really advantageous. I, I cannot tell you. And it, and it translates into so many other aspects of life, whether it's replacing a tap washer uh, in a sink or, you know, changing a fuse in your house. Like there's very real world practical applications for learning how to fix and repair stuff. 
Um, but I think the big disadvantage is knowing, like, when something is, <laughs> is built badly, you can't help but think about it. Like, everything that I own, like my personal camera collection, it is 90% made up of stuff that I can fix because I just, like, I don't want to own it if I can't fix it myself. And it, and it like, having that knowledge, knowing what goes into a lot of this stuff is a real curse. Um, yeah, I think that's probably the best way I can describe that. But it is obviously, like, I also just enjoy doing this. Like, when I take apart and fix a camera, like, yeah, sometimes the repairs can be frustrating or sometimes a client's camera will give me a lot of grief. But I get so much pleasure and enjoyment out of, you know, taking something that is broken or, or otherwise useless or was being thrown away and breathing new life into it that it's like, when I do that, like, every trouble that I had was worth it. You know what I'm saying? Like, even more worth it. Um, it just doesn't feel like work. Like, I've since migrated from doing healthcare full-time into basically doing this full-time with healthcare on the side. Like, I, I have a few locum jobs planned for later in the year. Um, this is like... Like, you know, there's the old saying of, like, uh, if you find find something you love doing and, and you'll never work a day in your life. Yeah, that's my life. <laughs> um, but, you know, I guess I have a knack for this kind of stuff. Not everyone has a knack for repairing, just like not everyone has a knack for painting, you know? Um, but, yeah, that, that's a really good question, Dennis. But, yeah, I, th I think it comes down to, like, there's a pro and a, and a con to knowing... <laughs> how the sausage is made. Um, it also, I mean, another advantage, I'll, I'll just say that it does help when I figure out if someone's trying to rip me off or not. Um, I've been to like a few camera markets where like I've been, you know, investigating something in my hands and like the seller is just absolutely talking out their ass. And I'm like, mm-hmm, yep, sure, mm-hmm. Cool. Like I remember, I remember picking up like a peel apart camera. This is long after Fuji had discontinued the film, and he's like, "Yeah, there's a, there's a someone saved the old Fuji peel apart machines, and they're making brand new film." And, I, and like everything he said was completely wrong. <laughs> like he he wasn't even referring to the Super Sense thing. He was absolutely just trying to get me to buy a camera. And like I knew, I knew better. Uh, and I've had I've had other cameras that I've seen where I'm like they're clearly broken. It's like no, nah, no, nah, it's supposed to be like like no, I know. So yeah, that, that's a that's a big advantage. Uh, let's see. Let's have a look at the next question. Um, Ashley asks, "What do I think is the most underrated Polaroid camera?" Um, certainly. I mean, look, two things two things spring to mind. The first is any of the Polaroid. Uh, 660 autofocus series so they they named these a few different names but they were generally called the 660 or the 670 i think maybe even the 770 uh i i don't no wait do i have one hang on i have one um this one is actually completely broken and beyond repair um but these when they work are incredible they focus down to three feet no they focus down to two feet Built-in flash, you can choose to shoot without the flash. They take 600 film natively. If they need calibrating, it's super easy. There are literally just variable resistors inside. You can mod them to take triple A's. More and more people know that these are great cameras now, so I, I wouldn't necessarily call them underrated. But if you want something that's cheap, yeah, go for one of these. Um, the Polaroid Impulse also had... A version similar with sonar and, and effectively the same lens as this it's in a different form factor it's a bit more compact uh, I do not recommend owning one mainly because they're very very difficult to repair um, 600 cameras are interesting because they are one of the only things I know of where they're entirely plastic not held together with screws only clips yet are still actually easy to take apart which is really really cool um, 
so yeah, I wouldn't say these are very underrated, but they're certainly very, very good. Um, I think possibly the most underrated Polaroid camera you can still get filmed for, and Ashley's the one you guys have probably seen her camera, she hasn't picked it up yet. Um, the Polaroid 1600, which I did in my sticker bomb video, uh, Pimp My Roid, um, these were the very last Polaroid ever produced. Uh, by the Polaroid Corporation before they went bankrupt. They are incredibly compact. They're super duper reliable. You can mod them to take lithium ion triple A's if you want to shoot eye type. They are really cool little pieces of kit. I never see anyone talk about them, ever. These, like, they never get a mention. If you know, you know. Um, I mean, this one I think is really cool because look how colorful and gorgeous it is. It's just friggin' awesome. Um, but yeah, I reckon these are single-handedly one of the most underrated Polaroids in existence. Uh, and so yeah, that is my answer. Thank you for your question, Ashley. Uh, excellent question. Let's have a look at the next one. Um, all right, so someone has, so this comes from Sean Connors9912, uh, who asked me on YouTube, he said, I just damaged the sticker on my SX-70 while cleaning with rubbing alcohol. Are those easily replaceable? Um, are they easy to remove from a spare parts camera? So what he is referring to is this sticker here under the viewfinder. Uh, the answer is it depends. On an SLR 680 and on most SX-70 sonars, actually there is a variant of the 680 that is easy to remove, but most of the time on a sonar, alpha, or a 680, this sticker is very difficult to remove. On an early one like this, it's pretty easy to remove usually with a bit of heat. Uh, but yeah, if you accidentally rub that too much with some kind of cleaning product, odds are you will rub the text off it. On a 680, it's even more problematic because this area, the, the reason the sticker is so dark is to avoid reflection in the eyepiece that's otherwise gonna ruin your view. Um, on the 680, for some reason, they went with a white sticker with black ink making like an inverse print. So on these, it's a black sticker with like brown font and the brown font is written on the black sticker. With a 680, it's the opposite. And so if you, if you wipe it, you end up with a white sticker and it's horrible. Um, I have been known to cut new stickers out of like black, pure black flocking material, which works really well in a pinch as a solution. You can buy reproductions, I think from like Polar Studio, some companies make them themselves. Um, fortunately, it's not really an issue. On early cameras, what I recommend doing if you've smudged it, just keep rubbing until it's a pure black sticker and it still looks good. Um, that's that's my uh, my advice there. So that was the first question that Sean Connors asked. Uh, and then he says, have I ever modded a Fuji Instax wide 300 to have a selfie timer? Now, uh, truthfully, I just don't work with Fuji Instax cameras. Um, firstly, uh, and this is a bit of a, I don't know, perhaps a petty reason, but I just don't like Fuji as a company ever since they discontinued Peel Apart Film. Not just that they discontinued Peel Apart Film because whatever, companies discontinue products all the time, like it's, it's fine. But rarely is something ever discontinued but so well documented. Um, and that was reading Dr. Florian Caps' blog as he tried to save the Peel Apart machinery and Fuji's reluctance to have anyone take over their machinery. I, I just, like, it just makes me sad, <laughs> you know? Um, and it, for the, the, the TLDR version is effectively, it came down to like an honorable sort of mentality in terms of the business. Fuji didn't ever want any competition um, to pick up an item and reproduce it where they had sort of seen themselves fail, I guess. That was their mentality. And uh, like I said, don't, don't take my word for this. This was all documented on Dr. Florian Caps's blog. Uh, Caps was the founder of the Impossible Project. So there was a period in time where the founder of Impossible was trying to get as much of the peel-apart machinery from Fuji as they could. So 
Um, the first reason I don't work with Fuji products is just I'm still salty. And maybe that's on me. Maybe I'm really missing out. Um, but the second thing is they're just, they're hard to work on. Like they're very fiddly. They're also very cheap. I mean, a lot of the Instax minis that I, because I get people ask to fix them all the time. They're like a hundred bucks brand new. Like you can't even pay my labor for that. <laughs> and as far as I, like, as far as I know, there's no like spare parts channel I could be wrong that that may have changed in recent years, but certainly when I started looking into it years and years ago, there was no, like I couldn't order parts. Um, but as I said, they're very cheap. There's a lot of advantages to Fuji and Stax cameras for sure. You know, they're, they're cheap. The film is a lot cheaper. The film is arguably more reliable than, than current Polaroid film. Although I would say that, you know, latest batches of Polaroid film are, are honestly fine. Like, this is at least on par with Instax, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but yeah, the, the cameras are just very small, very fiddly. Um, the benefit with working with old Polaroids is, like, all the soldering is relatively easy to do because it was designed in an era before they really made everything microscopic, so you can still solder everything on one of these by hand with relatively simple tools. Um, doing any kind of elect electronics works on more modern stuff when tin solder is involved, all of a sudden you need like a heat pad, you need hot air guns, you need even tinier tips on your soldering iron than this. Um, so yeah, look, F F Fuji, it's just, and, and the last point as well with Fuji, I just, I don't, particularly enjoy any of their cameras like Fuji to this day although they did just release a very in interesting Instax Mini called the 99 literally as of today as I'm recording this video um, which is really cool it's got a lot of really awesome features but I just I don't feel that emotional connection with the camera and I'm just I'm just not really interested in working with them um, if you want a great Fuji camera, Mint makes one called the TL70. It's way better than anything Fuji makes. It's a TLR. It's, it's really freaking cool. The aperture goes down to f5.6 instead of limiting you to like f12.9 or whatever their, their lens does. Really, really cool stuff. Um, and one more point, I did make a custom Polaroid 110A that had a, a Fuji Instax wide back. I'll try and chuck some photos of it up as I'm talking about that. Um, I built that as a one-off. I never ever want to build one ever again. It's so time consuming. Um, like it took me a week and a half in order to get it to the <laughs> to the specification that I desired. Um, so yeah, because I just don't enjoy the film that much, I don't enjoy using the cameras that much. I don't enjoy the aesthetics of it that much and purely because I, I don't appreciate what Fuji did in terms of scrapping all their machinery, um, which like I said, maybe that's a flaw on my behalf. Maybe I should forgive and, and, and move on with my life. Um, it's just a personal thing. Uh, so yeah, thanks for that question, Sean. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Uh, all right, JCKF says, what is the perfect combination of SX-70 parts in my opinion? Yeah, as I just explained, this one. I really like the 680 rollers, the bellows from a Model 1. I like the jokeness of the Model 3 body panels, but I mean, they don't do anything. I, I really like the sonar. Uh, shutter system. So the sonar autofocus, but being able to attach a mint flash and gain that functionality or, you know, attach PC sync strobes or, or whatever. I really like the SX-70 sonars as camera, uh, as cameras. They, they tick all the boxes. They got a tripod socket. They got the strap lugs. Um, this, as far as I'm concerned, is like the best combination of parts because for me, it makes it the easiest to work on. And I value that as a technician. There's a lot of people that, that won't care, right? But as someone that works in the industry, I ain't interested in owning something that's gonna be a pain in my ass to repair. I, I want something that's simple. I already do this all day long, let alone keeping my own stuff serviceable. All right, uh, at Mega Marioization says, 
What do you think of these spectra systems? Being that the film has been discontinued for a while now, I wonder what someone who's used them in the past when they were still being supported thinks of them. Also another question, uh, actually let's, let's keep them as, as two separate things. So first of all, what do I think about spectras? Well, I am happy to say that I was from the generation. I was there, man. I was there. I still have my spectras. I have two flavors. I have the Spectra MB, which was like the business edition of the Spectra. Um, I have upgraded it to have the handle from a Polaroid Pro Cam. Uh, since the original Spectras had like this horrendous skin on them. And as you guys can see, I had Aki Asahi back in the day, like this is like a decade ago. I sent him to Japan a Polaroid Spectra and had him make out a leather template specifically for the Polaroid Spectra so that I could skin them in genuine crinkle embossed black leather. So it's entirely possible I have the world's nicest Spectra MB uh, in terms of like the strap, the handle, the skin. Um, yeah, these were really great cameras. They were arguably the most advanced camera that Polaroid ever made. I also have the Pro Cam, which has the record for being the widest lens uh, put on an instant camera uh, from the factory. I believe this is a 90 mil lens. So it's certainly very, very wide. Um, what did I think of them? I liked them. I, I would use them every now and again. I must say though, I didn't love them. So although I was a little bit bummed when Spectra was discontinued, um, I wasn't like, I wasn't super sad about it. I was just like, oh, that's really disappointing that these great cameras now no longer have film. Um, but it kind of, like, the, the, the reason that the film was discontinued, it just didn't sell. Like, these were never as popular as the Polaroid 600 and probably not the Polaroid SX70, despite the fact that they were great cameras. No one used these as much as the others, so... I do sort of understand why Polaroid chose to discontinue the Spectra film and rejig the machinery to make Polaroid Go film. I get why they did it, but I would have preferred they just make a new camera that takes Spectra film in order to sell more of it. You know what I mean? Like, I'm sure people would have been willing to pay the price for the larger image size had there been a new camera that supported it. Um, you had the whole thing about, like, the jamming film issue which seems to come from the roller tension just being very, very high and the motor not having enough power to push that thicker film stock out. Although it is curious to me that in the early days of Impossible Project, all of my Spectras seemed to work fine. It seemed to only be like when the Polaroid Originals rebrand happened that Spectras magically all started jamming. I've never figured out a true reason for that, uh, I do know if you power these things off lithium ion batteries and give them rock solid voltage, then they have no trouble ejecting. But it is what it is. I'm kind of reminded of that, uh, that like variety clip show episode of The Simpsons where Troy McClure is like, they do the ad break and they're like, which popular Simpsons characters were killed off between season one and two? If you guessed, Marvin Monroe and uh, Bleeding Gums Murphy. Well, you're wrong. They were never popular. Um, that's that's kind of how I feel with like Polaroid Spectra. I'm like, which popular format of Polaroid film was recently killed off? Spectra? That was never popular. <laughs> um, but they were great cameras. So um, the cool thing about these is the standard Spectra system, like you could get even more advanced ones. But the standard Spectra system had so many controls on it. You had a built-in self-timer. You had built-in autofocus that you could turn off if you were shooting through glass. You had a built-in flash. You had exposure compensation. You had a remote. You had a wireless remote that you could use with it. You had a distance reading in the viewfinder that you could set to feet or meters. And most importantly, you had a little bing bing dingin' speaker noise, which would tell you like if you weren't focusing correctly, you'd go like, eh, eh. 
I'm, I'm pretty sure that's how that worked. Anyway, it's been years since I've used this thing. It should still work, it's just sat around in, in its bag. Um, but I must say that compared to an SX70 and compared to even a box type 600, I just preferred to use those over the Spectra. I don't really know what it was. I guess for me, just the extra features didn't really matter. Um, but they were great fun to use. And the Pro Cam certainly was, was good fun as well. I don't really like the viewfinder on this. I think it it's really lame to look through. Like it looks kind of weird and distorted. And it's, you, know, you have to keep your eye in a very specific spot. But yeah, these were cool to use as well. Um, I mean, it's so chunky. <laughs> look at it. Just look at it. But yeah, these were, these were cool cameras. Um, and there are people that make like adapters where you can kind of shoot 600 film in a Spectra, but it doesn't spread the emulsion properly. It's, you know, they don't give the best results. Uh, but yeah, good question. I was there. I did enjoy Spectras. Um, I spent a lot of time, as I said, repainting them, reskinning them, customizing them, cleaning them inside and out and, and selling them. I sold heaps of them back in the day. I was bummed to find out that the film was discontinued, but for me, it wasn't the end of the world. Uh, the second question, is there anything pertaining to SX-70s that I wish would become more available or readily available for the modding and servicing community? Any old tech that I would like to see revived on a larger scale? Uh, yes. Plenty of various SX-70 parts that I would love reproductions of. Um, starting with body panels. In particular, this viewfinder panel here. This viewfinder panel at the top, called the short panel, you'll find it very regularly broken on chrome body cameras because the fiber-filled polysulfone plastic is more brittle than later model black and ivory cameras, just because these are made out of ABS, which is a bit more flexible. These are a bit more rigid. And what you'll find is, because of that hinging mechanism, if these clasps are too tight and there's a lot of force to open the camera, over time, that stresses these two sides and causes cracks. Um, so I would love a reproduction short panel. Um, that would be freaking awesome. I would also like reproduction door panels um, and reproduction bellows would be amazing. <laughs> like that would be really, really cool. A reproduction Fresnel screen as well would be great. Um, but I don't think that's ever gonna happen because it is way, way too unique a part. I, I, I just don't see it happening anytime soon. And if it did happen, it would be so expensive. Um, but I would love to see those things become more readily available as spare parts because they are the most common parts where if those are bricked, like there's nothing I can really do other than harvest those parts from another camera. So yeah, I'd love to see replacement body panels. I would love everything to be reproduced on one of these. I'd like to be able to build an SX-70 from scratch. That would be really, really cool. All right, next question. Uh, what are my thoughts on using an ND filter for the use of 600 film in comparison to a conversion? Really good question. Let me just go grab an ND filter real quick because I'm sure I have some. I'm very positive. I have some just off to the side here. Um, because my, my opinion, the, the short way for me to answer it is conversion all the way. Here we go. Um, for those that have no clue, um, what, was, what was your name that asked that question? Uh, Goofy Goober, <laughs> he asks. Um, yeah, for those that don't know what these are, these are basically little sheets of ND material which go over a pack of film before you insert it into the camera. So you kind of put it over the film like so before you insert it and it reduces the light coming in by two stops, so a factor of four. And what that does is allows you to shoot 600 film in an unmodified SX-70. Um, I just, the, the, the cool thing about that is you don't need to modify the camera, but there's a significant disadvantage, and that is that you lose all the benefit. Like the only thing you gain 
is being able to use 600 film and maybe that's good for you if it's all your local shop sells. Um, the real advantage of a 600 converted camera such as this one with the new PCB, um, actually I'll grab another one too which is 600 modded. Um, this is actually one I just finished up for a client. Um, the advantage is when you have a 600 modified camera and the shutter is converted, the shutter is basically working four times faster. So on an SX-70, what that means is in a bright scene, your aperture is smaller and the speed is faster. That is going to make your photos much sharper than if you're shooting SX-70 film. The other advantage to this is you can use the camera in a lot lower light environment. Like I was just showing you guys this photo. This is probably taken at the equivalent of like one tenth of a second. Super crisp, super sharp, completely indoors, all natural lighting, only being lit by a window. This is not possible on a standard SX-70. The shutter is just way too slow during this exposure. It would end up motion blurred, whereas here it is super crisp. So. I really just don't recommend bothering with these filters over the pack of film because there's no real advantage. You don't gain, like the main advantage to swapping from 600 to SX-70 film is the speed increase. Like you're getting that much, much, much faster ISO of film. Um, and one little tip that I'd like to share in this video, uh, let's check this out. This is my SX-70R. Let's just chuck a pack of film in there. Right? That's set to 600 by default. If I take that same filter material, so I still purchase one. This camera is 600 modified. Let's say I want to do the reverse. Let's say I have a 600 camera, but I want to use SX-70 film. Well, guess what? Take that same filter material Cut it into a little strip and insert it down the light dark wheel into the electric eye. Or just tape it over the eye. Get a bit of sticky tape, tape it over the eye. What you've just done, you've reduced the light going into the eye. The camera now thinks it's two stops darker and it's going to expose for your SX-70 film again. So if you have a 600 modded camera, you can do the opposite. You can slow down a shutter very easily by tricking the eye. You can't speed the shutter up very easily. Does that make sense? So in my opinion, 600 mod all the way, it's just like the, the pros more than outweigh the cons by just so many factors. And the only real advantage that you get from SX-70 film, I would say is up for debate because there are purists that will swear, that will cross their heart and hope to die, stick a needle in their eye, that SX-70 film has better colors or... But it depends who you ask. Some people are like, oh, it's got better contrast. And then another person will go, no, it's because it's more pastel. And then another person will go, no, well, the blues are better. And someone will say, no, the reds are more vibrant. The truth of the matter is that SX-70 film, how it's currently produced, is basically 600 film, but the negative, as far, I, as far as I'm aware, is kind of tinted to reduce the light. This was all explained in uh, Ben Fratinali's video. He, he hosts in an instant. He did the Polaroid factory tour, and they speak about it in that video. Um, there is so much variability within batches of film of the same kind going from month to month because they're constantly trying to improve the formula that I would say trying to compare 600 to SX-70 is a fool's errand. The other thing you have to consider is when you do a 600 mod and that shutter is firing faster with a smaller aperture, you're going to get different lens characteristics from the SX-70 lens. Uh, the more it stops down, the better the contrast is going to be because when an SX-70 is shooting more towards f8, the images are a lot softer uh, with more chromatic aberrations. When it stops down, the images are a lot sharper. So they're always going to look different. There's no real pro or con. But as I said, if you if you have a 600 modded camera and you really want to shoot SX-70, just do that. It's, this, it's literally the same thing. 
um, but you can do it the other way around. So, um, and yeah, I feel very strongly about this, um, especially here in Australia where I live. It's very hard to find SX-70 film, whereas 600 and I-Type film, I can just go to my local office supply store and pick some up there. So yeah, for me, 600 all the way, using these, waste of time, um, unless you do it the reverse way. Uh, but yeah, really good question. All right. Um, next question comes from Happy Blad. He says, if I were to design an instant camera in the 1970s, how would it compare to the SX-70? Would it be the same design? I'm no designer. Um, <laughs> This thing, as far as I'm concerned, might as well have been built by aliens. Look at it. It is so radically different to anything that has come before or since that the SX-70 truly is without peers. And I'm not just saying that because I repair these things for a job. There is nothing like this. Nothing else exists. I couldn't hope to be one-tenth of the designer and inventor that Dr. Land was. He truly had a beautiful mind, and so did the rest of the people on the team behind this camera. Um, I think, honestly, if I was to design it, I would have ended up designing some kind of box camera like this. It would have been very boring. It probably would have still been an SLR, but it would have been like some big bulky thing with a prism like a traditional design. I, I think I totally, <laughs> there's no way I could have come up with this. I'm just not that clever. I can fix these things real good. Me smart like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, the design of this is just amazing, isn't it? Like there's, there's a reason that these are so highly coveted. Um, and I don't think we'll see something like this produced anytime soon, ever again. Truthfully, I, I, I really believe that. Um, but just, just on the topic of my design, um, because like, I, I guess when it comes to what I do, there's a lot of innovations that I've made with SX-70 cameras, such as figuring out how to refurbish motors. And there's, there's a lot of repair techniques that I've been able to come up with. There's not a lot of stuff that I've truly designed. Where I think my strengths are is in my ability to take off the shelf components and transform them into things that we can repair cameras with. Uh, and I think a good example of that is my Polar Vault, uh, which I'll just, I'll go grab one. Yeah, the, uh, the Polar Vault, which is my iType battery solution, uh, which I showed off a few days ago. This is like how I design things. I, I take things that already exist and turn them into different things. <laughs> so um, what I probably would have done is taken some kind of like, I don't know, pre-existing Polaroid and figured out how to make it different. Um, but yeah, this is like, just to modify the question slightly, this is more my speed of design. I like things that are very open source, very modular, that don't necessarily have to rely on a massive supply chain of like very strange proprietary parts. Um, I also like design to be as simple as possible. So I probably would never have made this, right? I would have made some simple box camera. Um, but like the way that I made, way that I did this design, I really tried to keep everything as simple as possible. Like it's attached with double-sided tape, very simple. It's got a buck converter which mounts inside the back of the battery. Very simple. Takes two batteries which you can buy very easily from any electronic store or just order them online. Again, very simple. The charger is very simple. Most importantly, the way to wire one of these in, although it's tedious and a bit time consuming and you can't just simply add it to the camera, you've got to do it while it's being refurbished, it works really well. And the simplicity comes from the fact that I wired the on-off switch to the hinge switch, which already exists in the camera. And so doing so means that turning the camera on, simple as erecting it, take a photo. You want it to turn off, boom, you just turned it off. So that's the kind of design 
philosophy that I like. I like everything to be like I, I really, I, I truly operate under like the Kiss principle: keep it simple, stupid. That's how I work. Um, maybe what I would have done is made the SX70 mechanical instead of electronic. So uh, I probably would have made like a box camera, but with a shutter that was mechanical. So like a, a Copal size zero, like Synchro Compu or something like that with a, a variable focus lens element and like a shutter button and then a separate button for eject. That's probably how I would have designed a camera. And spoiler alert, in the very, very, very back burner, I have something like that that I'm trying to work on. I don't think it'll ever see the light of day. I've made prototypes, but nothing successful so far. That's probably how I would have designed something, is it would be a box camera like this, with a dial set, like mechanical, click, click, set your aperture type shutter. Uh, maybe have a rangefinder on it, but yeah, that's probably what I would have done for the SX-70. Um, but yeah, really good question. Um, that's mine, that's mine, and this one here is my client's. I'm just gonna make sure I put this one away. I don't want to start losing things. All right, so let's go on to the next question. I, th I must be nearly, nearly at the end. I think I had about 12 or 13 questions. Uh, Daryl Johnson says, what are my thoughts of taking the battery pack from the 600 film and putting it on iType pack to shoot out of a Sun 660? All right. Um, I think what they might be referring to is... This, this sort of like Instagram reel went viral a while back where someone had a pack of iType film and they were encouraging people to get an empty pack of 600 film. I hope this is what this question refers to, by the way. Um, they take the battery out, encourage people to like tape it underneath the iType film and then insert it into the camera like some kind of sandwich. Now, in a 600 camera, you can kind of get away with this. There is like just enough room. But in my humble opinion, and since you did ask for my opinion, this is one of the stupidest things you could ever do. <laughs> it is so dumb on so many levels. First of all, it's just, it's way too thick. Um, whenever you do that, you put too much stress and pressure on the body panels. Um, you risk damaging the battery, causing a leak, causing some kind of a short. You risk, you risk this little sticker that helps you peel the film, peel the film out, ripping off as you try and remove the film. You risk the film getting stuck in the camera. Most importantly, you risk showing thousands of people watching your Instagram reel that you can try this safely with any Polaroid camera. And if you try that on an SX-70, you will destroy the SX-70, I can just about guarantee you. Um, because the chassis in one of these is made to way tighter tolerances than say a 600. Um, if you try that, and look, you can kind of cut down the battery a little bit, but if you try that, like, first of all, it, it barely fits. Like, you are gonna have to absolutely jam that in there. It's never gonna come out again. Um, you risk damaging the battery terminals inside. You risk damaging the pick arm. Most importantly, the plastic layer of the chassis is held onto the steel part of the chassis with plastic rivets. You will bust them if you try and do that. So. It's really silly. Um, a much better, cleaner solution is, where do I have one? Here we go. A much better solution, do it properly, get the camera iType converted. So get it to take external like batteries. Especially if you have a 660 AF, four triple A's, not only fits really well on that sloped surface at the back without altering the footprint of the camera, um, 
but it just does it a lot more safely. It's gonna give you much more reliable performance and you don't have to screw around so much. Also, AAAs are way easier to find as a battery source than having to source Polar Pulse batteries from old Paxa 600. So uh, yeah, I do not recommend you do that technique. When I saw that video, I cringed. Um, and I hope that is what you're talking about. You can of course do another technique if you happen to have an old pack of 600. In a dark bag, you could actually take out the photos from an iType pack and manually feed them into the 600 and then load the camera in the dark. I do that if I, if I need to. Um, that works really well. I've, I've been known to do that on a few occasions where I had to test a 600 modded camera that had no iType power solution and all I had was iType film, so I got an old pack. That is fine, that's fine to do, but do not try and do that like battery under the pack thing is such a bad idea. Alrighty, next question. Uh, do I have experience with previous Polaroid instant types such as pack film or roll film? Um, and how do I feel about current Polaroid versus old Polaroid? Um, yes, I have lots of pack film experience, Believe it or not, that's where I started. Um, my business used to be pretty much exclusively doing pack film cameras. This is my personal Polaroid 190 Land camera. Uh, it's currently loaded with some 3000B. I paid the grand total of 100 Australian dollars for this because it was in need of a service. And obviously I serviced it and got it working. Um, I really enjoyed it. The image quality that you could get from one of these surpassed anything available today. Like the quality you get out of this camera will not be replicated anytime soon. I can just about guarantee you that. Uh, these were amazing, especially if you bleach the negatives that come on these peel aparts. It's just wonderful. Um, but yeah, that's what I used to do. Perhaps while I'm talking, I'll throw up like a few gallery photos uh, of cameras that I've refurbished in the past. Um, because yeah, that's, that's what I did for years. It was only when they discontinued peel apart film that I really pivoted to doing SX-70s and making that my main gig. Um, before that, my specialty, uh, and I happen to have one, I think this is turning into show and tell. Um, this is the kind of thing that I would do for clients. I would actually take uh, their cameras and I would install like custom lenses and shutters and things on them uh, in order to give them better performance. So this was like just a very cheap Polaroid 220 land camera and I stuck this uh, Soviet Indistar 110 mil on there, which is a far better performance than the original. It's got an f4.5 aperture and these were really great for portraits. So. Uh, yeah, that's, that's what I used to do. I used to do stuff like that all the time before I pivoted. Um, but I've never shot Polaroid roll film. That's just way too old for me. Um, and how do I feel about current Polaroid versus old Polaroid? Um, in terms of their cameras, I think their old stuff was better. I guess you could argue their old film was better too, but Maybe a better question is how do I feel about current Polaroid originals versus like shooting impossible project? And I'm very, very, very happy with the current state of film and things like that because the quality that you can get is just really, really nice. Um, it's a joy to shoot now. Um, my friend Ashley and I were talking the other day about shooting like impossible project film um, <laughs> you know, a good 10 years ago and comparing it to like the quality that you can get now. And it's just, you can't even compare. So what I like about the modern Polaroid company is that they seem very dedicated to keeping this kind of stuff alive. Yes, they discontinued Spectra, but their support for SX-70, 600 and iType has stayed rock steady. And to be honest, as long as they at least produce iType film, I'll be happy because well, all SX-70s can be modded to take iType film. So provided I have that, I'm happy with what they're doing. Um, 
Yeah, I think that's really all I wanted to say. I would like to see their cameras improve in terms of uh, battery design, as I touched on very briefly before. Their modern cameras, as of me releasing this video, have built-in non-rechargeable lithium-ion batteries that are not easy for the user to replace. I want to see that scrapped because basically every other company in the world is making these things with replaceable batteries. Um, Fuji's brand new Instax 99 has a user replaceable battery that you can just swap when it dies. Um, so that's what I would like to see Polaroid try and do. Um, but otherwise, love them as a company. Uh, next question comes from, oh god, this username, itchyballs8946, unbelievable. Um, how do I feel about Polaroid in their current states? This is a very similar question to what got asked before. Um, do I wish they would focus more on film chemistry rather than apparel or speakers? Is there anything I'd want them to focus on besides... Uh, or perhaps something that I would like to see from them. I think I kind of answered that in the last question. Um, I'll say it again. Make your batteries user replaceable. God damn it. <laughs> like, we shouldn't be needing to rip our cameras apart every three to five years when the lithium ion battery dies. That's what I would like to see from current Polaroid. Other than that, I honestly think they're doing pretty well. Yes, they had a bit of a misstep, at least from a public relations standpoint, when they did Polaroid radio and, and, and the Polaroid portable Bluetooth speakers and stuff. I think all of that stuff is fine. I mean, as a company, you have to try and branch out and try and make money where you can. If it fails, so be it. But you're not going to... You're not going to... Um, What's the word that I'm looking for? You're not going to, like, innovate sitting on your ass doing the same thing all the time. And I think that's where Polaroid needs to take some, like, I guess some steps out of history and think of, like, oh, whenever Polaroid was doing something great as a company, it's because they were innovating a lot and making something really unique. And I think that that probably should be their focus in terms of photography, um, you mentioned, do I wish they would upgrade the current film? I mean, they're always focusing on the current film. That's literally what the people at the factory do. There are people, and, and I won't go into it because people have covered this way better than me, um, but there are people who sit there and their entire job is just figuring out how to make the film better. That's why it changes so much from batch to batch. Like, one of the biggest complaints is, oh, the film has so much variance, it's always a little bit different batch to batch. Yes, because they're trying to make it better. <laughs> the, the, the reason it has variance is because you keep saying it's not good enough, and they keep trying to make it better. <laughs> it's like, it's so irritating when I hear people complaining about the film. Also, it's not that bad. <laughs> Compare this to Impossible Project shit like 10 years ago. It's infinitely better. Um, I mean, look at that. Let's get the camera to focus closer. You can't be mad at that. Look at the blacks. Look at the skin tones. Everything about this is gorgeous. This isn't even fresh film. This stuff's like from uh, July last year. It's like nine months old. It was stored unrefrigerated. Look at it. Tell me that's not good. <laughs> Right? Look into my eyes, right? Um, but I, I believe that what they're focusing on, as far as I've heard through my tech connections, is at the moment they're pretty happy with colors. And I, I really do agree. I think their colors are great. Um, I think that everything that they're achieving from a color standpoint is excellent. Um, what they're going to focus on going forwards into the future is more things like faster development time. Um, things like... Uh, what's the other word? I was, it was It's faster development time and... Oh, yeah. Um, just like better light protection and less flaws. So I, I think colors they're happy with... They're, what they're trying to hone in on now is like the fastest possible development time and how to avoid like opacification failure and stuff still. Um, that's my current understanding. Um, but yeah, when people are like, oh, don't you just, don't you wish that they would just focus on making better film? Man, they are making better film. Like 
all you have to do is look how far they've come, starting again from scratch. And yes, uh, Fuji are making Instax, which has been reliable for years, but they're completely different scenarios. Like I said, I won't go into why that's different. Go and educate yourself if, if, you're, if you're not familiar with the process, but they've improved a hell of a lot. Um, where I would like to see them focus is just on better customer support, better ability to have their modern cameras be repairable because as a technician, I get asked a lot to fix their new cameras. And there's, as far as I know, again, at the time of me releasing this video, there just isn't that. Like if they break under warranty, they'll send you a new one. There's no way to get them repaired, no schematics or anything available, even if you're an independent technician. So, you know, if this dies, this is only a few years old, you can't get parts for it, right? Despite this being a modern iType camera. Um, so yeah, that, that, that was a really, really good question. Um, look, in terms of their, um, in terms of their uh, audio gear and, and other stuff, I think what they should focus on is retro because clearly that's where their target audience is. And I think that they should focus, maybe rebrand, call it Polaroid Retro or something like that. Probably what Polaroid should do is have a different sub name. Like we've got Polaroid Originals, they might need like Polaroid Music or something like that, or, or, or just come up with a new business name if that's what they really want to do, just to separate it. Because I think the name brand Polaroid is too heavily associated with photography for people to trust it. It would be like if McDonald's started doing real estate. Like, would you buy a house from McDonald's? I don't know, <laughs> maybe you would. But I, I think their name is too ingrained with photography for them to ever be really successful in other endeavors. I think if that's what they want to do, then I don't know, maybe they've got to have some kind of sub branding like Lexus and Toyota. I don't know, I'm not an expert at any of that kind of stuff. I just know how to fix cameras pretty well. Um, but yeah, certainly making their current cameras more repairable and doing something about the battery situation, I would really like them to, to focus on that. Otherwise, I'm happy with the film. I, I genuinely, I don't really ever have any complaints these days. It is so rare that I have an image which is ruined that I just, I simply don't care. Uh, Puffy Puppets 741 says, what do I think the biggest misconception is about the SX-70s and SLR-680s and their inner workings? Oh, this is really easy for me to answer. Um, the biggest misconception is that these things can be 50 years old and still work reliably without a service. It just isn't going to happen. Because of a combination of, number one, age, like if you are 40 years old, you probably need some servicing too. Number two, some unforeseen design flaws due to these uh, beautiful cameras being kind of rushed to the market to please shareholders. Uh, and due to number three, later model cameras having design flaws from uh, cost reduction because they really tried to make the later cameras as cheaply as possible. Um, it basically guarantees that any Polaroid camera that you purchase, at least the folding SLRs, any of these that you purchase will need to be overhauled and serviced for the best results. Now, to a lot of people, that's just going to make sense. But when you see people complain in forums and online that they're getting overexposed photos or their camera jams, basically, if they're having a negative experience, the overwhelming amount of times they're shooting with granddad's old camera that they just pulled out of the shed and it's like filled with fungus and half falling apart and they're wondering why they're not getting great results. Well, it's because you're using 40 year old technology that hasn't been serviced. And I think it's really interesting because there's sort of this expectation that it's just gonna work, but so many other areas of life, you wouldn't expect that. Like if, if you'd had a car sitting in a barn for 40 years, do you expect it to turn over when you go to start the car? No, like that would just be insane to think that. Um, if you had, I don't know, like imagine buying a house that had sat there for 40 years untouched. Do you expect everything to still work or is it gonna have problems, right? Like the, these are no different. <laughs> um, 
to get the best results out of an SX70 or a 680 or a 690, whatever the folding SLR might be, just because of their very nature, because of their age, they really need to be serviced. On cameras such as the 600 series, these are a little bit different. These are way simpler in terms of the way that they're, they work and the way that they're designed and are basically bulletproof. These you can kind of grab off the shelf and, and they'll tend to work. The reason for that, there's no infrared filter layer that corrodes like on the SX-70s and nine times out of 10 on a box type 600, you're shooting with a flash. And the flash is what's controlling the exposure. And the flash would generally fire at the same power as it did back in 1985, right? So you don't need the shutter to be super accurate. You don't need the electric eye to be super accurate. You just need the flash to go off and you're gonna get a good photo. That's why these things seem to work so much better without any problems, um, purely because of that. Um, but yeah, that's, that's certainly, and like it, it, I sort of, I end up driving myself a bit mad at how much I have to hammer that in, but it's just, it is so unknown. Like people don't seem to realize people, people get fed this information like, oh, I've got to, you know, with the new film, I've got to set it all the way to dark in order to get the best results. Well, yeah, the reason you have to do that is your shutter has gone sticky and your electric eye is filled with crusty gunk. <laughs> if you have your camera serviced, you can leave it in the middle, right? Like that's the reason that it's like that. So yeah, very, very good question. And I think that's the, uh, that's my, my favorite way of answering that. Uh, the last question comes from Hi H, I believe Hugo is their name. Uh, they said, what made me want to work on instant cameras? Have I done work on 35mm or medium format cameras too? Um, what got me into this hobby is a hell of a long story. I would encourage you to check out the podcast that I did with Matt Loves Cameras, who's a fellow Australian, uh, he does a photography podcast. Him and I had a great discussion where I discussed all about how I got into this. It's like an hour long. It's very well worth a listen. We had a great chat. We talk about so much cool stuff. Um, but in that, I really described the nuts and bolts of how I got into this hobby. Um, so I'll leave that part of the question for the podcast. Maybe I'll try to link that below. But in terms of have I worked on other cameras, the answer is yeah, I have. Um, I just don't really do it commercially. Um, I'm pretty good at fixing like old TLRs, uh, I've refurbished a few Leica cameras over the years. It's just not something that I do because I don't do it regularly enough to want to guarantee people that, yeah, I'm going to be able to fix your camera. Like if someone sends me an SX-70, there is a 99% chance that I'm going to be able to get it up and running. Unless they send me something that's completely and utterly destroyed, which I have seen, but the overwhelming odds are I'm gonna be able to guarantee, yeah, I'll get your camera running better than better than new, right? Whereas 35 mm cameras are all built so differently. 120 format cameras are all built so differently. Just because I work on one doesn't mean I can work on another. Just because I fixed a Ricoh Flex doesn't mean I can fix a Rolly Flex. Just because I fixed one issue with my Canon A1 doesn't mean I can service your Nikon F2, right? Um, but I do, I, eh, maybe I'll link up a bit of a gallery. Like I've refurbished things like Mamiya C series. I've refurbished speed graphics. I've refurbished lots of different stuff over the years. But unless I'm selling a camera, I don't really do it for clients. Um, unless it is something that I could absolutely guarantee. And that's very rare. Um, I'm just, it's just not my business model. But yeah, uh, to answer that question, yes. I am fairly handy. A lot of the skills that you learn fixing Polaroid, you can transfer to other things. Um, so I am fairly handy with other cameras, but I, I just don't do it on a professional level. And that, that might have been the last question. Let's see, is there any others? Um, Red Zombie 2 k says, do I think anyone will ever bring back an affordable version of Peel Apart film? It's possible, nothing is impossible, but it would cost lots of money. Um, the machinery required, like the only reason Impossible Project was able to do this is they purchased the machines from the factory 
and they were told, you'll never get this running again. It's impossible. So they went, challenge accepted, bought the factory, and because they had the machines, the machines are the hard part. To build those machines costs billions of dollars. Millions, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. Because they are huge. They're like the size of a train, right? Massive, massive industrial machinery that produces this film. Um, and the only reason that Edwin Land was able to start it in the first place is he invented polarizing filters, and that patent was used a lot by the US military. So he had more money than he could ever dream of. <laughs> so, yeah, he... Um, he spent a lot in terms of research and development and, and coming up with it. So certainly someone could resurrect the format. People already are doing it on a very smaller scale. Um, but the best opportunity to have done that has come and gone. And that was, as I said earlier in this video, Fuji with their peel apart machinery. Fuji chose to completely scrap the machinery so that no one could produce a version of it, basically. Um, and that was Fuji's decision. It's not a decision that I'm happy about their making. It's very well documented. Like everything that I'm saying was documented by Dr. Florian Caps on his blog. Um, I'm not making any of this up. Like that's just, I read it in real time as he was posting it back in the day. And I highly recommend you guys go read about that saga if you want some insider information. But look, it's, it's technically possible. I would love to see it done. I just, I don't think there's the demand for it. So I don't think it'll happen anytime soon. Um, I hope that wasn't the last question because that's going to be such a somber note <laughs> to end on. Yeah, that was the last question. Well, on that depressing note, um, no, but seriously, you guys have been a wonderful audience. I, I hope that you're still here at the end of this video. Um, I have no idea how long I've just been talking for. Um, probably a long ass time. <laughs> so yeah, hopefully you guys can enjoy this a bit like a long format podcast. Um, and yeah, I would just like to say thank you again for everything that you've done. I mean, your, your support, your following, allowing me to live out, you know, what's basically been a dream of mine for a long time to repair these wonderful things full time. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. Um, if you'd like to support me, send me something to fix. If not, leave a donation on the links below on my coffee account, um, or simply just like, subscribe, and share the content. I hope everything that I said has been enlightening and that you've learned something from it. And as always, if you have questions, feel free to ask. I will very likely cover them at some stage in the future. Um, until then, have a wonderful day. I wish that all of your photos come out perfectly exposed and perfectly composed. And I will see you next time.